Praise God. Good morning, church. So happy that you joined us for this Sunday worship. You may take a seat as we uh, study for today's word, as we prepare ourselves for the taking part in the Lord's Supper, taking part in the communion. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Thank you guys for reminding this and telling this to us. But in order for us to be in that stage of where we realize that we are just, we are, it is time for us to more than just survive, we were made to thrive. You want to know why. You want to know why. For what reason? Why should I thrive? Why should I not just survive? Why is it more about just, uh, more than just about living and surviving here on earth? Why is it? that I should be thriving. And that is what I want us to think about today. That is what I want us to answer today, that question of why. The question that you probably asked yourself this morning, why should I go to house the gospel? Why should I go to church this Sunday? Why should I go to this service? Why should I go to this church? Why should I even wake up? Why do we do the things that we do? And I think that's the biggest and probably the most a uh, frequent question that we ask ourselves. It's a question that we may even be asking every day. Why am I doing what I'm doing? It's a question that a lot of uh, younger people ask themselves. Why am I here on earth? Why am I alive? Why did God create me? Uh, that, that is a big question. That is a major question. And that is a question that Jesus answers in a parable that we will study today. You know, uh, when... Uh, uh, we were getting married with my wife, and uh, we were planning our wedding, and we were planning a few things uh, besides the question, why am I marrying her? Uh, and she was asking, why am I marrying him, right? And trying to answer that and make sure that we're not making a mistake. One of the major questions we were asking our ourselves is, uh, why should we live in Fresno? Why should we not live in Sacramento? Because my wife comes from Sacramento. She was spent most of her life there before we got married. I spent most of my life here before we got married. So why Fresno? Why not Sacramento? We had to answer that question for ourselves. And there, there were multiple factors that had to be factored in. Multiple things had to be factored in. We looked at uh, relatives, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, her parents are there, my parents are here. Okay, whose parents win kind of thing, right? Um, we looked at kind of our job opportunities. We, got, we looked at work, maybe, uh, opportunities, income opportunities. You know, another factor that we looked at was our ministry. Like, uh, ministry was a, was a key factor. Like, okay, if, if we leave Fresno, what ministry are we going to be involved in in Sacramento? And if we leave Sacramento, what ministry are, are we not leave? Well, yeah, leave Sacramento. Well, what, what ministry would we be involved in here? And partly, I think ministry was the biggest factor as why we answered the question, why stay in Fresno? And so, uh, you're welcome, by the way. Uh, I'm just going <laughs> to uh, say thanks to my wife. Anyways, uh, you know, and we, we ask these questions, and depending on how you answer that question, why, that is going to kind of, in, that is going to influence your decision making. You know, oftentimes, you, you, the, the way you make decisions on your career or your profession or the job you're going to get, like, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you working in the place you're working? Have you ever thought about that? Okay, some of you are probably in a specific career field because my mom, when I was young, said, you're going to be a nurse, and she said, forever, you're going to be a nurse, and I've been a nurse forever, ever since. Or my dad said, you should be a teacher, and so I'm going to be a teacher forever, right? Right? For some of you, it's actually passion, which is actually like it would be the best if this is something that you really wanted to do. Like, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. This is what I want to do the rest of my life. I love this career. Or I love this profession, right? So depending on how you answer the question why will influence the decisions that you make. The lesson that Jesus teaches in this coming parable that we're going to read is a lesson on purpose. Uh, one thing that I want you to keep in mind today is that there is a purpose for everything. And there is a purpose for your life. 
There is a purpose for everything, and there is a purpose for your life. So if you ever wondered, okay, why am I here on earth? Why am I even uh, created, or why am I even alive here? There is a purpose. And Jesus teaches that purpose, and, and unfortunately, oftentimes, we have different purposes. So we'll see in the example of this parable how there could be wrong purposes and how there can be a right purpose to live. So if you could bow your heads with me and uh, we'll say a quick prayer. We ask you, Lord Jesus, we ask you, Holy Spirit, as you have already, as you are already present here today with us, we ask you that you please um, speak to us as, you, as, as only you can. Speak to each of our hearts because you know our heart, you know how we listen, you know how we receive your word. Please open our hearts to receive it. Open our ears to not just hear, but to listen to what you're saying, so that what we hear we may apply in our lives and it may bring fruit into our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, uh, today we're going to be in Gospel of Luke chapter 12. So this is the New Testament, this is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third, third gospel in the New Testament. I encourage you, if you have your Bibles, open them uh, wherever, digital Bibles, physical Bibles, uh, open them to Luke chapter 12. This is where we're going to be at the whole, ser- the whole sermon, the whole message. Um, so we're going to be studying this section in Luke chapter 12. But before we study the parable itself, I like to set the context. And this is what I've been doing the past few Sundays. I've been trying to set the context so that you can visually, uh, with your m- mentally, I guess, you can try and be there, try to transport yourself back into that scenario. So the, the scene, the context that we're in is in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Here's where I want us to start. In Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Luke introduces the next topic this way. In the meantime... When so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another. So this is what I want you to see. There is a lot of people. (laughs) Well, the parable we're going to hear, the scenario we're going to see, the message that Jesus is going to teach happens among thousands of people. And it's not hard for me to believe this because there's other scriptures that tell us that Jesus at one point Uh, fed 5,000 people. At one point, he fed 6,000 people. So thousands of people, thousands of people were uh, following Jesus. They wanted to hear what he had to teach, just like here today, okay? Thousands of people wanted to be there. Um, And so uh, I just want you to imagine Jesus surrounded by this crowd, and you can see they're trampling one another. They're, They're really pushing on each other, this is, this is not your typical mosh pit. This is the real one, okay? Uh, people are pushing on each other. This is your, I don't know, what, the Queen concert or something like that? Uh, just imagine a lot of people, crowds and crowds and crowds of people. And here's what happens. Jesus kind of starts his teaching. He teaches through, from verses 1 through um, 13. He's teaching about the kingdom of God. Uh, he's teaching about being being uh, aware of the Pharisees and different religiosity and things like that. And in verse 13, a man in the crowd gets up and says some, the following. This guy gets up, uh, and in verse 13, chapter 12, we read the following. Teacher, he says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So this dude, uh, there's thousands of people listening, and this guy decides, you know what, this is a great time for uh, me to bring this topic up, okay? And I can only imagine that his brother is actually right there in the crowd, okay? I, I, I definitely, because I, it, this is probably like the younger brother telling the parents something, you know? Like, hey, dad, tell, my, uh, tell this guy to give me the toy back or something like that, right? This is what is literally happening. This guy comes in and he's like, hey, Jesus, while there's thousands of people listening and all these witnesses... And you, you know, you being the teacher, tell this guy. It's not even a request like, hey, what do you think, teacher? If, let's say, for example, a friend of mine had a brother, right? No, he doesn't do that. He's like literally, Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to do this. And I can only imagine this brother is probably sitting right there like looking at him. 
dude, what are you doing, man? Uh, and this guy's like, well, I told you, don't, don't push me, right? And so they're, they're, there's these two brothers, there's Jesus and everyone else, what are they doing? They're like, okay, we're looking at one brother, look at the other brother, look at Jesus, what is Jesus going to do? So this guy picks a perfect time to call out his brother, okay? Now, we don't love our brothers that way, we do it differently, so uh, the lesson here is uh, don't, don't just, don't wait for the thousands of people moment. Do it uh, a little bit with, with a few, uh, a little bit lesser amount of people. Anyways, this is kind of like, Jesus, what do you think? What do you think, Jesus? And uh, Jesus actually answers him. And he doesn't directly say this. It, Jesus doesn't directly say, okay, this is how it's going to happen. This is how you're going to separate your inheritance. Here's what Jesus says in Luke 12, 14 through 15. So Jesus said to this man, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator arbiter over you? First thing I want you to see in verse 14 is that Jesus is saying something more than just being dismissive. He's not trying to say, this is none of my business. What Jesus is trying to say, I think, is he's trying to say, this is not why I'm here. I did not come to planet Earth to deal with spreading inheritance. I did not come to planet Earth to try and see who can win the Super Bowl, okay? I'm not here for those kinds of issues. The kingdom that I came to bring, the news that I came to say, the, the, the message that I came to give you is much more different. It's much more bigger and on a different level than what the society is saying here. It's much more different than what you know uh, based on what is happening here, okay? So here's the rest of his answer. He says, take care, take care, be very careful, beware, use careful observation, and guard yourself, guard against all covetousness, guard against all greed, be careful, do not be greedy, Desiring more will bring you to greed. Why? Because one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession. Now, I don't know how many of you knew this before, but that, there is truth to this statement. First of all, because Jesus says it, and second of all, is because we see it in everyday life. Like, if, if you make possessions as the main goal of your life, as the main purpose of your life, you will soon realize that that is not a good purpose in life. And that is exactly what Jesus is trying to say here, that it is not about the possessions. Possessions do not give life its purpose. Life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Life does not consist in the amount of homes you have. Life does not consist in the size of the house you have. Life does not consist in the size of your bank account. Life does not consist, the purpose of your life does not consist in how many toys you have. Although my two-year-old may argue with me on that. But guess what? We grow up and 20 years after being two years old, we're doing the same thing again. And we're competing with each other to see who can have the more possessions, who can have bigger toys, who can have better toys, who can have more uh, contemporary toys, who can be ahead of the other. Possessions do not give life its purpose. That is the message that Jesus wants to give to this brother and to you today. But here's a question. Who is Jesus talking to? The brother who asked for inheritance or the brother who didn't give the inheritance, didn't share what do you guys think? I think Jesus is talking to both of them. Jesus is saying to the man who really is being very uh, upset with his brother who's not sharing the inheritance, like, don't live your life setting your life's purpose on this one thing to have possessions. And I think he's talking to the brother who is not sharing their inheritance. Look, you're going to hold on to this, but remember, life's purpose is not about possessions. And of course, Jesus is talking to everyone in the crowd, to the thousands of people, and he's basically saying, you need to change your priorities. 
you need to change your focus. You need to change your, your purpose. Your purpose in life should not be about possessions. And it's not the first time that Jesus teaches about the importance of not focusing on possessions. It's not the first time that Jesus says, my kingdom is not about how much wealth you have, but, how, uh, but rather how much faith you have. In, in chapter 4 of Luke, Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Focusing on the word of God rather than on the physical belongings. In Luke 9, 4, 24 through 25, Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You can gain the whole world, but you can lose your soul. Why? Because the purpose of life is not about possessions. It is about your heart and your soul. And that is what Jesus wants to say through this parable today as he goes into this parable. The message he's trying to say is that my kingdom is not like the kingdom of this earth. My kingdom is about not having more possessions. My kingdom is about what you do with those possessions and where your heart is, really. So let's read the parable. Can you imagine that? We didn't even get to the parable yet. Well, so let's read the parable. Chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And remember, as we were going through these stories of Jesus, I told you that there's two reasons why the parables were told. One reason is to get rid of everyone who didn't really want to hear Jesus' teaching. Not get rid of them, but to kind of block them from understanding. The second reason is to help those who want to know about Jesus to understand. So, those of you who have ears, open them and hear. So let's read the, the following parable. 16 through 21. And Jesus told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And out of those thousands of people, I'm assuming there are a few rich men who are like ready to listen. Okay, Jesus is talking about me. Hmm. And he thought to himself, this rich man, uh, I will do this. I will tear down my barns. I'm sorry, did I skip a verse? And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Oh, there's a problem. He has so many crops, he doesn't have a place to store them. And he said, you know what I'll do? I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Relax, drink, eat, be merry. Does that phrase sound familiar? But God said to him, fool. Well, does that word sound familiar? This is the only time in the, in the history of this uh, church that I can freely use fool and not feel guilty about it. Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This, Jesus tells us a story about this rich man, and uh, this rich man has a dilemma. He's been blessed by God. Anyone want a dilemma like that, being blessed by God? Anyone want to be blessed by God? Wow, only five people, okay. Well, that's why you're not, you, you're not blessed because you don't ask, okay? Now, it's okay to, be want to, to want to be blessed by God. It's definitely okay to ask God, please bless my family and bless my life and my job, right? This guy is blessed by God to such an extent that he runs out of place where to store his grain. Grain is like pretty much, it's money, it's finances, it's, it's wealth that he uses to trade if he wants to get even wealthier. Grain is like gold in the day. And he has all this grain and he doesn't know what to do with that blessing. Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, you've been so blessed in life that you're stuck in knowing what to do with it? This is the guy. The guy's like, I've been so blessed. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this great thing is I'm going to keep it all. 
I'm going to keep all the blessing. I'm not going to share with anyone. I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to build bigger storehouses, bigger barns to keep all of that blessing. He was running out of space, and so he did this amazing solution based on what he thought. Here's what uh, one of the pastors, Charles Swindle, how he describes this, this man in his own words, in today's words, I would say. So this is what it would look like today. The business of a wealthy entrepreneur was off the chart. Every idea worked. Every decision succeeded. He began thinking to himself, this is a gold mine. My major problem is out-of-control growth. I'm running out of space. There seems to be no end in sight. This is my plan. I will enlarge headquarters and I will multiply my staff. I will add a warehouse nearby and open several branches each year for the next 10 years, exactly as my consultant has suggested. As the business continues to grow, I will slip further and further out of the picture and leave the work in the hands of my efficient executive staff, and I will just take the profits and enjoy them. Eat, drink, and be merry. I might even retire early. Sounds like Amazon. Anyways, uh, no, you know, this is such a current visual for us today. You may not have a business with a multiple branches. You may not even have a job that's making you millions of dollars. But uh, to some extent, you have more than many others. You have so much more than many others. And God has blessed you with so many different blessings in your life. He may have blessed you with uh, good health. He may have blessed you with good looks. He may have blessed you with good gifts, with good talents, with financially he may have blessed you. He may have blessed you with a specific personality or a specific brain that helps you to function in a way that you don't feel worry about things. You don't feel stressed. You, you feel like, man, life is just happening. Things are going. I'm buying, I'm selling, I'm making money. This is good. Life is good. And life was good for this guy. So is it wrong to be successful? Is it wrong to plan ahead and build up some storehouses and save some wealth and save some money? I don't think there's anything wrong with having. And there's nothing wrong with having much. Bless you. Jesus never attacked wealth. He always addressed motives. Here's what I want you to remember. Jesus never attacked wealth. He always addressed motives. In one of the uh, passages, Jesus says it is hard for a wealthy man to get into the kingdom of God. Jesus never criticized wealth, but he always said, look into your heart and see why you are doing what you're doing with your wealth. You know what the title of this parable is? Anyone see it in their Bibles? What's the title of this parable? The parable of the rich fool. Okay? Fool is only mentioned once in here, but it's titled the parable of the rich fool. Why fool? Why this word fool? In the Old Testament, the word fool was often used to describe a person who rejects the knowledge and ways of God. A fool would be someone who would say, I don't need God in my life. A fool would be someone who did not acknowledge God for the things that he or she has. A fool, in one of the scriptures, actually says, a fool said in his heart. What did the fool say in his heart? Anyone know? There is no God. Thank you. A fool said in his heart, there is no God. And that is what Jesus is pointing to here. He's not pointing to the wealth of this man, but he's pointing to the heart of this man. And in his heart, there is no God. This man doesn't have God in his heart. And in a sense, Jesus is saying, if you are a fool, if possessions are the pur purpose of your life. You are a fool if possessions are the purpose of your life. Notice what was his whole purpose, this rich man's purpose. 
was to get so much money and get so much wealth that he could do what? Could retire early, sit back, eat, drink, be married. And he's like, once I get to that point, that's it. Life is good. Once I get to that point where I don't have to work, where I don't have to do anything but just sit back, relax, eat, drink, be merry, that's the point of my life. Guess what? Jesus says that's not the point of your life. You're a fool if you think that's the purpose of your life. You're a fool if you live from one party to another, from one vacation to another, because you're putting your goals, you're setting your purpose based on these uh, temporary things that will waste away eventually. You're a fool if your possessions are the purpose of your life. Let's see how the foolishness of this man is evident in this man's life. Let's take a look at why is it that he's a fool. Notice, I really like using the word fool right now. So, here's one thing that I, that I think shows that he's a fool, that proves that he's a fool. For a minute, he thought that he was in charge of his own life. He was pretty confident that he is in, his, in the charge of his life. Look at verses 18 and 19 in your Bibles. Here's what he says he's going to do. He says, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. If you didn't notice, I made a special intonation on the word I and the word my. Multiple times he says this is my, these are my barns. This is my crop. This is what I will do. This is the strength I have. This is the wisdom and the intelligence that I have. Look at how smart I am. I came up with this great idea to multiply my wealth. He's relying on his brain, on his physical strength. And he's even saying to whose soul? He says, I will say to my soul. Guess what? Your soul is not your soul. It is God's soul. Your life is not your life. It is God's life. Your car is not your car. It's God's car. Your money is God's money. Your work is God's work. And why? How do we know that? Because tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, you're not going to be on this earth anymore. The car will stay. The house will stay. Your bank account will stay. Your family will probably stay, and you won't. It's not even your family. It's the first thing we do when somebody comes to visit our house, right? Hey, check out my family. Check out this beautiful house, my house. And that is the mistake we often make, and I often make, is that I forget that God is the one who gives, and God is the one who takes. He is the one who gives, and he's the one who takes. This man was blessed beyond his imagination, beyond his plans, and yet what he did with that blessing is keeping it all to himself, and he said, I am in charge of my own life. You fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Whose will they be? And I think the second mistake that this rich fool makes is that he thinks that he, uh, that he lives for himself. He lived for himself. Eat, drink, and be merry. That is the purpose of my life. It's just, it's my body. It's my work hours. It's my strength. It's my brain. I use it. I deserve it. Because it's my life, and I want to, whatever I want to do with it, I do with it. Bigger barns versus giving to those who have none. Retire early instead of sharing the surplus. And he's only thinking of himself and trying to use this wealth to take care of himself and maybe even to save himself. He forgot one truth, is that... It's not his, and he's not to live his life for himself. 
we serve God by serving others. We serve God when we share with others. We serve God when we use what God has given us to serve other people. And just like this man, you and I, we're limited. We're limited on the time we have here. We're limited in the sphere of influence we may have on people. We're limited on uh, how much we can or cannot do. And I think everyone here, myself including, must answer these important questions. Where should I invest what God has given me? What should be my priorities? And the big question is, why? Why am I here? Why am I here on planet Earth? Why am I here in the States? Why am I here in California? Why am I here in Fresno? Why am I here in 2023 instead of 1023? Why is it that God has chosen to place me in this specific place at this specific time with these specific people? He did not do it so that you would gain more possessions. He did not do it because you would be smarter. He did not do it because you would be better. He did it because you would be better for this time period and this place for His purpose, for His glory. So God created you to not be a fool, but to be a wise steward of all that He gave you. God created you to be a wise steward of all that He gave you. That means, first of all, acknowledging that the life I have is the life that He gave me. That goes to acknowledge that the strength and the health that I have is the strength and the health that He has given me. It is to acknowledge that the, the job that I have, the family that I have, the people around me that I have, the church that I have, the community that I have, is something that He has given me. My bank account is something that He has provided me with. So Jesus ends His parable and says, this is the story of the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He says, there's, there's, two purposes. there's one purpose in life that I approve. And that purpose is to be rich toward God. That purpose is to glorify God, not to glorify yourself. And we as people, we often unfortunately make this mistake of living for ourselves rather than for God. A wise steward is someone who acknowledges God, acknowledges His authority, and acknowledges His power. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, whatever you do right now, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Our purpose of life is to bring glory and honor to God with our possessions, with our lives, with our resources, with our talents, with our gifts. And so today I just want to pose this question to you again. Why are you on this earth? Why are you in this country, in this specific state, in this specific city, at this specific time period? Why? Why are you in this church? Why are you at this service today? <laughs> you could have been somewhere else. You could have been at a different church. You could have been listening to a different service. You could have been missing such Sunday's church in general, but you are here today. So, is, is God giving you the answer right now? Would you glorify God? with your actions, with your possessions, with your resources. Unfortunately, today's society has flipped it. And the most important purpose in life today for many people in the society is to know and to love yourself. To know and to love yourself. That is what the society is telling us. 
It's all about you, who you are, who you can be, who you can potentially be, who you pretend to be. It's all about loving ourselves and making ourselves feel good. And Jesus says, I I got a different message for you. It's not about that. It's about loving others. It's about loving God and loving others. It's about serving God by serving others. That is a wise, rich man, not a foolish, rich man. You know, throughout these um, studies of parables, uh, I have been bringing us back to Jesus and I I wanted us to see Jesus in all of these parables. So we talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we saw Jesus as the Good Samaritan, right? The foreshadow of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is the Good Samaritan who lays his life for the man uh, dying on the side of the road. We talked about the sower, right? The sower of the seeds, and we talked about the fact that Jesus is the living word that is sown into our hearts to produce life. We talked about the uh, last Sunday, we talked about humility, and we talked about that Jesus is that humble servant who has laid his life for us. As we look at this parable, I was like, Jesus is not a foolish rich man. No way. How can we, how can we see Jesus in this parable? And I, and, you know, um, there's, there's a few things, a few passages that led me to to, to realize that Jesus is the opposite of this foolish man. He is the wise, rich man. Jesus is the wise, rich man. Here's why I say that. Multiple times in the, in the scriptures, uh, Jesus says, I came not to glorify myself. I came to glorify whom? The Father. God the Father. Uh, Jesus prays to, to God the Father, and he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus had everything. I want to thank the worship team for reading that passage from Philippians that we've read multiple times through these parables, and I want to remind you of that passage. The passage in Philippians that says that Jesus had everything. He was with God, and he had everything in in his hands, but he got rid of all of it. He... He, he gave it all away, and that passage says to take a position of a slave. To take the position of a slave. Do you see the contrast between the foolish, the, the rich fool and the wise Jesus? The rich fool kept everything to himself, and Jesus gave everything away. He became a slave. so that you would have life so that you would have forgiveness so that you would have uh, so you would have this opportunity to, to reconcile with God to become friends with him to become his child to become his disciple to live for him not for yourself pray together you know one of the things that the first things that you want to give away that you think is in your possession one of the first possessions you want to give away is control of your life And the way you do that is you basically just ask Jesus to be in control of your life. Ask Jesus to be the king of your life. To be the Lord of your life. Ask him to forgive you for keeping control of your life and not letting go and being prideful. And tell him, I'm sorry, Jesus forgive me be my king and be my lord and take the wheel take control be the guide be the master of my life i don't want to be in possession of my own life because i'm a fool when i do that 
And I make so many mistakes that, man, if, if I was in full control of my life, I would be all kinds of messed up person. So Lord, I give my life to you into your possession. Take my life and guide me. Lord, forgive me for walking away from you and taking possessions for myself and living for the possessions instead of living for you. Lord, all we want to do is glorify your name. We want, we want to say that this is your church, that uh, my house is your house, that my car is your car, that my bank account is your bank account, that my family is your family, my relationships are your relationships, Lord. I do not own any of it. Will you take it? Will you take charge of it? And just teach me how to be a good steward of what you give me. Teach me how to be a good, faithful servant to steward the things that you give me so that it may bring glory to your name. Lord, teach me because that is what you've done. You have fulfilled and accomplished the work that you were given when you were here. Help me to accomplish and fulfill the work that you have placed me here for. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Church, let's continue in worship. <laughs>